Okay, testing. EP Nautilus, this is ECC testing on SPL. Uh, yeah, hey ECC, this is uh, Nautilus. Uh, we can hear you. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone watching on Nautilus Live. Um, this is Mike Brennan, co lead scientist of this expedition uh, out at Papahanaumokuakea National Marine Monument. Uh, we are descending with vehicle Atalanta. We're currently at 3,600 meters. Uh, we're descending to a site, uh, a shipwreck found in 2019 by the research vessel Petrel and the Vulcan Inc. group uh, of what is believed to be the wreck of aircraft, Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi. Uh, so it was found with um, side scan sonar on an autonomous underwater vehicle. Uh, so we have that imagery um, and they uh, identified the, the wreck based on its dimensions. Uh, so we're gonna, this is the first time that we've put eyes on it with an ROV. So we're excited to begin this descent or continue this descent and uh, get to the bottom and take a look at this wreck for the first time. We are um, just settling into our our watch seats uh, as the 12 to 4 watch comes in. Um, <clears throat> and as we continue descending, we're going to be stopping every 500 meters to, uh, to pause and check uh, winch tensions and sea states just to make sure that we're uh, all safe with the vehicle uh, underwater at, the, at this depth. We're going to a depth of, do you know the depth? I think it's like 5,400 meters. That's just right. Oh, it's in the dive plane, isn't it? Yeah, it's just under 5,400 just meters. Under 50, yeah, it's a uh, depth is going to be 5,370. Uh, so a little bit deeper than the dive on Yorktown the other day, uh, yesterday, uh, which is a, a little under 5,200. So just a bit deeper, so give us some time. Um, similarly, we're going to, um, our ship moves are going to be very slow because we have so much length and weight of, of the fiber optic cable in the water that's tethered to the ROV. So we're going to be making very slow and deliberate ship moves that'll take a little while to translate down to the ROV. So it'll often look like we're just sitting in the water, but it's that we're waiting for the vehicle to catch up to the ship move so that we can continue exploring and documenting the wreck. Yeah, thanks, Mike. A um, couple more things here, just for those people who uh, joined us uh, yesterday. So overnight, we transited about 130 nautical miles to the west and going to the second focal point of the Battle of Midway. And our very talented and hardworking mapping team uh, mapped over the target this morning, uh, did uh, find an anomaly exactly in the place that we expected it to be. Uh, so yeah, that's the area that we're going to be dropping down and uh, excited that you all can join us. Um, also of interest is there were uh, in the mapping survey, we, we went exactly over the spot uh, where we're going to be diving today, but also a little bit to the west and found a couple other anomalies, uh, a few nautical miles here to the west of interest. So that might be of interest in, in days here to come of the uh, expedition.
Front row, can you tell us what rate you, we are descending at? We are descending at 24 uh, meters a minute. Thank you. It's your favorite at-home math problem for everybody if you're interested in uh, estimations of how quickly we can get to the seafloor, although we will be pausing and continuing to assess that we can advance the dive safely. Uh, just divide that total dive time by rate and calculate that out. Uh, Nautilus, this is ECC, testing, testing, testing. Hi, ECC, this is Nautilus, we can hear you. Hey, thanks so much, just configuring some audio on our end, appreciate it. Yeah, sounds good. Phil, can you introduce yourself and share who's there with you? Say again, Nautilus. Would you mind introducing yourself, Phil, and sharing who's in the room with you? Sure, absolutely. Um, Phil Hartmeyer, marine archaeologist for NOAA Ocean Exploration and uh, co-lead scientist ashore here with uh, my colleague, Jim. Jim Delgado, uh, Sir Tink, co-lead uh, co ashore. Dan Poyar, expedition coordinator for NOAA Ocean and we're also joined by uh, Shanna Daniels from the Navy History and Heritage Command, who just stepped out for a second. Very good. Glad to have you guys uh, tuning in again. We're about uh, 1,500 meters from the seabed, give or take. More or less? Yeah, more or less. It keeps changing, you know. Probably. Boy, it's great news. I mean, following the uh, following the depth track is been getting more exciting by the by the minute. Great stuff. Yeah, thanks to all of the viewers that are uh, joining us on Nautilus Live um, and sharing in this exploration in these moments with us. Um, our dive plan is to conduct this exploration for about 24 hours. Obviously, this will be um, including our ascent and descent and ensuring that along the way there, we are keeping within our safe diving parameters. So uh, that's why you hear these kind of slow, slow and careful oh, starts to um, the expedition beginning um, and to the to the dive beginning excuse me across the expedition these are deep depths um, over 17,000 feet beneath the ocean uh, over three and a third miles down so major distances that requires different technology um, which uh, will also has warranted a lot of how this dive plan was designed um, we're diving with Atalanta uh, the tow sled and imaging sled um, rather than little Hercules or ROV Hercules, some of our more frequent players and technology tools on our team. Um, we are beyond the depths that ROV Hercules is rated to dive to and uh, the vehicle ready to um, make the dive today was Atalanta. We had a, some incredibly beautiful imagery, moving imagery collected yesterday from Yorktown with this platform. So um, really happy to uh, be visiting these realms to have the opportunity to come into this space um, using this technology.
throw this one out for maybe our sci lead scientists or our uh, expedition leader, co-lead expedition leader sitting here. Um, someone would like to know um, how were these dive sites chosen? Were there so many wrecks as part of the Battle of Midway and the larger Pacific? You know, what made the decision to come here to this location? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Uh, thanks for that extra round question. And uh, uh, so I think it's really important to understand a little bit the history. Uh, so this is a uh, really considered one of the main or the, the most important battles uh, of World War II, one of the biggest naval battles ever, um, and uh, happening oh, just over four days in, in 1941. And um, the, there's been several expeditions um, in sort of the last 25 years that have tried to locate the, the four aircraft carriers and two uh, large ships and hundreds of aircraft that were lost during those four days. Uh, 81 years ago, uh, the first of which was work by Dr. Bob Ballard in 1998 in partnership with the Navy and the National Geographic Society. Uh, that located the USS Yorktown. So 25 years ago, that was the first effort. And, and since then, there's been multiple attempts to try to locate uh, the three Japanese aircraft carriers that were lost and uh, work that has, you know, some of the major ones there, so actually NOAA Ship Okanos Explorer uh, and the NOAA Office of Exploration and Research, uh, a major partner and sponsor of this expedition, had an expedition in 2016 where uh, we were trying to locate these, but weather conditions did not cooperate and we're not able to dive on them. Uh, after that, there also were attempts uh, by several others. Uh, Nautilus Corporation uh, had some uh, efforts and they actually located some of the debris field of the Japanese aircraft carriers. And then four years ago, the, our research vessel Petrol and an expedition led by Vulcan Inc. in partnership with the US Navy was able to locate the aircraft carrier Kaga and document the site and also map the site that we're on today. Um, and so we've been partnering and collaborating with a lot of the researchers that uh, led those expeditions in the past uh, trying to gather all the data that was available and has compiled over the last 25 years uh, to try to get the best available information together and see if we can locate these. Um, so uh, it's it's really a big collaboration bringing together the ma many efforts that preceded us and got us to this point. And uh, so yeah, in terms of picking uh, the general area and the significance of the war, that's just, a, this is just one of the most important events of World War II. And uh, in terms of looking where to search, that's been uh, thanks to the many collaborations and many people that have worked in this area before us and are continue to work with us. So yeah, thank you so much for that question. I guess a couple more things I can add just in terms of uh, another way to view this, this the, that question in terms of how we pick our dive sites. In general, uh, you know, our vessel is uh, just a handful of other uh, state-of-the-art research vessels which is dedicated fully to ocean exploration, so going to places that have not yet been explored and getting to have the first glimpses of what might be there. Uh, people don't realize that the vast majority of our planet uh, is uh, in deep waters that have not yet been mapped. 80% of the ocean has not yet been mapped with modern technologies and much less than 1% has actually been imaged with, with video cameras or photos. So there's a, a big, big unknown in the deep ocean. Uh, and in terms of in general how we approach exploration, we do a, a the first tier is always getting good C4 maps. Uh, so if you can't see what's down there, you have to listen, uh, meaning that we have uh, acoustic sonar, so mapping systems that use uh, 
a sound basically to to get a sense of what the seafloor looks like. Uh, so in every one of our expeditions, we map, uh, and those maps are then important to pick out features that might be of interest, places where there's more topography, more texture, something of interest in the seafloor, and this is very true for these wreck sites. So getting good maps of where you might look in more detail. And that is then this next order of, of exploration, deploying uh, visual uh, technologies that are able to get a good sense of what might be on the seafloor. And that's what we're doing right now, deploying, in essence, a, a camera system to get, a, get us to look at what's on the seafloor. And uh, the third thing that is very special about uh, Nautilus just is that we also have telepresence technology and basically are able make to a note share there those in images. The Jacob, that we have paused at 4,000 meters. With the world. Average tension is uh, 10,000 pounds. Max tension is 12.8. Uh, I would say no. You're good. Maybe average is uh, yeah. Pick the middle of the squigs there. Maybe average is yeah, eleven thousand. Give or take a kip, we're good. Headed south. So we've reached uh, four thousand meters. Now we're gonna pause here to take a look at the uh, the wind tension and the weather conditions. Uh, and then continue down. Uh, again, we're heading to a depth of about 54, just under 5,400 meters, uh, which is very deep. The Atalanta is rated to 6,000 meters, and um, I'm pretty sure this is the deepest Atalanta has ever gone, so that's pretty great to see. Yeah, yesterday sat, set our maximum depth record for ROV Atalanta and have the possibility today of taking that further. Yeah, that's great. What's that? Oh. Repress your uh, Grafana page there, would you? Sounds good. think about those things. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Maybe Mike and Hans, you could take this question. Curious, um, kind of what sources do you look to as you begin, or, you know, our ECC collaborators, please feel free to jump in as well. You know, what sources do you look to as you want to learn about these folks? these sites. Folks are bringing up some of the Hollywood movies that have been done, certainly some of the popular stories that we know, but what do you all look to for, for references? Yeah, um, 
Sorry, I was I was fiddling with my uh, console here. Can you repeat that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, the question is, what kind of you know, what kind of sources do you look to as historians? You know, and maybe what do you think about some of the the popular sources of the way we know these stories? Our Hollywood movies and oh, yeah. some of those things. Um, but you know, when you set out to learn about these sites when they haven't been visited before, when we haven't seen them visually, what kind of sources do you use? Yeah, so there, there's a wide variety. We, we have a whole bunch of books uh, up here as well. We have um, one of the Osprey books that just has, is really good for illustrations of, of the wrecks, which um, even if they're like, we have also have a 3D book of Akagi, um, which is kind of like a 3D model, and it just really helps us visualize because obviously the wrecks are not going to be, um, you know, perfect looking ships. So it, it helps us kind of see through uh, what should be there, and then we can assess kind of after the damage and the sinking and being underwater for 80 years that helps us assess you know which and helps identify which features of the wreck we're looking at we have a couple other books um there's a lot of, of history that's online now and uh one of the one of the troubles with trying to look at uh for, for records for example of the construction of uh warships for example from from other countries is that uh you know i don't speak japanese or german for example that sort of thing um and so a lot of it is, is becoming available online and translated. Um, for example, for yesterday, we, we looked at a lot of the after action reports from the Battle of Midway for um, a, assessing what battle damage there was on Yorktown. Uh, but there's similar things, um, uh, assessments and, and uh, diagrams of what battle damage was sustained by uh, the four Japanese carriers as well. So that's, that's all very helpful. And, and we'll be using that as we slowly go around this wreck to, to document that battle damage. As far as uh, Hollywood and, and other representations of the battle, uh, I've seen uh, quite a few of those, of course. And uh, honestly, they, they get a lot of the details right. They kind of, they gloss over a lot of the complexities as you'd have to. But uh, especially, I most recently watched the one that came out, I think in 2018 with uh, Woody Harrelson. Um, it, it got a lot of the details right, like that Admiral Halsey had a skin condition when he came back from the Battle of Coral Sea, uh, the the, the, uh, the code breaking, uh, the, the U.S. was able to um, read some of the Japanese messages, which gave them a hint as to what their Navy was doing and that they were going to be uh, trying to, to take the island in Midway. Um, so there's a lot of details like that and what some of the, the pilots were doing on, on the different ships. Um, they strung them together. Um, th there was a moment that Nick Jonas's character got into an aircraft and, and fired its gun from the deck at an uh, 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 oncoming Japanese aircraft that just narrowly missed them. That actually was done. It was the same character, but he did that during the, the, our bombing run on the Marshall Islands, uh, Kwajalein and a few other islands there that the Japanese ha had at the time. Um, and, and they put that in as, as part of one of the Midway uh, battles. It is actually a, a couple of weeks before that. So there's there's some uh, distortions just to make kind of an engaging story and have some of the characters stand out. Uh, but overall, I was actually, having just read up on it, I was actually impressed with how many details they did get right. Um, but obviously there's there's a lot of Hollywood liberties as well. Right, that's always nice to see to see accessible public versions of movies and things that uh, actually pay attention to the historic narrative and try to get some of those details right. It's kind of a surprise when it happens. Yeah. But it's kind of icing on the cake. Yeah, I, c I can forgive some, like, blatant Hollywood, like, <laughs> you know, making things more dramatic or whatever. If they get certain details right, that kind of, like, tell me as a, as a history buff, like, okay, they, they do yeah. actually know the story and they're, they're doing it more for viewership. Yeah. But you, you, you're con trying to condense a, a multi-week, uh, you know, uh, military um, operation in, into a two-hour film is is always going to be challenging. Yeah, yeah. What I like about this mission is that you know this is a a very pivotal, significant moment and battle, and so it's been studied quite thoroughly uh, by academics, by by naval academies, and so even for some of the secondary references that compile a lot of information together, and I've looked at where the battle damage is expected to be, etc. A lot of that information comes from primary sources. And primary sources are, you know, reports, you know, at the time done by first-hand observers. And then, Mike, you're right, those after-action reports from the U.S. side, and also the translated after-action assessment done in, uh, I think it was 1947, yeah. is, is important information for understanding, you know, 
that side of the story and the impacts to their carriers. Thank you for sharing that and welcome to all our viewers who are joining us today. Um, thank you for tuning in. We currently are in Papa Hanaumo Kuakea Marine National Monument, which is the largest uh, largest marine protected area in the U.S. We're in the unexplored northwestern corner, currently descending our ROV, remotely operated vehicle, uh, Atlanta, down to hopefully uh, potentially see Akagi, which was um, da which sunk during the Battle of Midway. Um, so while we uh, make our way down, it, it will take a while because we're being extremely careful with um, the wave conditions, um, and it takes a while to ensure that our operations are running smoothly. Um, we'll take this time to go ahead and do some introductions. Uh, so again, my name is Kara. I am the Science Communication Fellow here, so my role on the EV Nautilus is really to storytell and help share um, some of the science and um, describe different findings that we're having and facilitate our learning together. And I'll pass that to my colleague to my right. Go ahead. Okay, Ali and hello everybody. My name is Else and I'm from the island of Palau in the Western Pacific. And uh, I'm here on the exploration vessel Nautilus as a supporting scientist. So I'm here to support in all different aspects uh, on board and uh, just excited and honored to be here. Um, Palau actually was part of the landscape of the battle in the Pacific uh, in World War II, so it's very interesting to see it um, from this perspective. And very honored and humbled to be here and all, um, with all of you guys. So thank you, and I'll pass it on to my colleague on the right. Hello, uh, I'm Upashana. I am one of the biologists in the team and the biologist with this uh, watch. And uh, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be a part of the part of this expedition and especially these dives on several of the shipwrecks. And with this, I'll pass on to Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Brennan. I'm um one of the lead scientists for this expedition. I'm a maritime archaeologist with Search Inc. Uh, we're based in Florida, but uh, are one of the larger archaeology firms in the country. Um, and I, I've spent a lot of time on Nautilus in the past. I was uh, I worked for OETN for the University of Rhode Island uh, and Dr. Ballard uh, for grad school. Uh, and it's really exciting to be out here, um, you know, and, and getting these vehicles down to depths greater than they've been to and exploring sites that. Um, have only been found uh, through sonar and, and, and not dived on before. So we're very much looking forward to, um, to getting eyes on this target for the first time since it sank uh, 81 years ago. Hello, everyone. My name is Hans Van Tilburg. I'm a maritime archaeologist for NOAA's National Marine Sanctuary System, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and very excited to be here and, and honored to be on this mission. This is a very special place. We're within the Papahanao Makuakea Marine National Monument. We're also within an area that's under a designation process to be considered as a national marine sanctuary, which would provide more enduring protections for this very special place, the natural and cultural resources, and certainly for sites like this, the battlefield of Midway, and aircraft carriers like these four, well, these one, this carrier we'll be looking at today, possibly the IJN Akagi. So it's a pleasure to be here. Taylor Ann. Hello, everyone. My name is Taylor Ann. I am the science manager and data logger on this watch. I will be logging all observations of what we see here in the next few hours. So I'm really honored to be a part of this team, uh, exploring you know, our history and getting a better understanding of uh, how the Battle of Midway ended. Uh, I'm very honored to be here on this team. Um, and you're looking forward to what we will see on this watch. Thank you so much for sharing. I'll uh, bring it to our uh, first row. Uh, video engineer, Jaina, would you like to share? 
Hi, yes, my name is Gina Galvez. I am originally from Hilo, Hawaii, and now reside in Seattle, Washington, and I am the video engineer on this watch. Um, as everyone else has said, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. Um, Jacob, if you're talking, could you um, maybe put the microphone a little closer to your mouth? Oh, my bad. That was my fault. Uh, aloha kako. Uh, my name is Jacob Wesley. I'm from Ever Beach on Oahu, but currently reside in Hilo, Hawaii. Um, working with the Mega Lab, or the Multi-Scale Environmental Graphical Analysis Lab. So, I'm um, the ROV engineering intern here, um, helping the main ROV pilot here get Atalanta down to these deep depths, and I'm very blessed to be in this special place. And uh, moving to our right, if we, if now is a good time, our ROV pilot, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, good morning. I'm Dan with the ROV team. Very grateful to be here and excited to uh, take a land to the new depths. Hi, and good morning. Uh, my name is Mia. I'm serving as the navigator. When I'm not navigating, I'm in the lab mapping, so always working to get more data. I'm very honored to be here. I've served my country in my ways and I'm from the DC area, so I know a lot of people have served. Uh, a lot of people have served in different ways, and also in the international community. Um, I spent uh, a few days going down to the Library of Congress, researching a lot about the middle, uh, Battle of Midway, uh, and I'm just really honored uh, to be a part of this this team. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mia. Um, this is really amazing to be with you all in this uh, control room in our e in, on EV Nautilus, um, exploring together this very sacred place for Native Hawaiians and this moment of history where there was a lot of sacrifice. We also have a team of um, scientists that are also tuning in um, and offering their expertise off the ship um, on shore. Would anyone um, on our team on shore like to introduce themselves as well? Uh, Kara, I do you know that they were um, resetting some computers in the Exploration Command Center. Um, so they may be back with us um, in just a moment, but if they're not there right now, that may be the explanation. All right, sure, yeah. I hope yeah. Uh, we can uh, catch up with them in a bit after they um, work out the computer situation. Absolutely. And also, um, we want to also note, you can check out all about the team by checking the team tab on Nautilus Live. Um, that's a great place to, to meet our co-investigators ashore, including three colleagues from Japan or collaborators from there who were really um, honored and we you know, celebrate and appreciate their knowledge as we do this exploration dive here on this site that we um, believe to be the Akagi. Uh, Want to note that this would be a first time exploration and so um, in the Battle of Midway, there were seven major ships lost uh, for both the U.S. and Japanese. I believe there are three in this area, three Japanese aircraft carriers in uh, the region that we are diving in right now. Um, so always something that uh, we will let the evidence tell us, we'll let the visuals tell us. Um, it's wonderful to use acoustics and detect what um, all of the information that we can, which really narrows the field of exploration, as Daniel talked about earlier, to um, get us to the point that we can find a target that we want to investigate visually. Okay. But of course, those those visuals, those clues, those um, evidence that come to us across the decades, that that's what allows us to make final confirmation. I think I heard our team in Silver Spring. Um, 
if we can throw it over to you, we'd love to know who is there uh, and you, what you're most looking forward to, why you're um, bringing to this dive. Yeah. Silver Spring, can you hear us? And while we wait maybe for the, our NOAA colleagues in Silver Spring to join us, I, I do think there's a couple of colleagues uh, from Japan that might be on the line. If so, is a, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, could you hear me? Loud and clear. My name is Jun Kimura, uh, one of the ashore uh, scientists uh, based in Japan. Um, I'm a maritime archaeologist uh, working at the Tokai University as an uh, associate professor. It's an honor to be um, the team member as an ashore scientist, and um, I'm very excited to um, uh, think that um, uh, Japanese um, air ca um, uh, aircraft carrier um, through this ROV missions. Thank you. June, it's wonderful to hear you. Thank you for joining this mission. It's really appreciated. Oh, hi, Ogum. Oh, hi, Ogazaimas, June. Thank you for being here. Ogazaimas crew, uh, it's 744. Um, in Japanese time. Hi, June. It's great to uh, to have you online and hear your voice. Uh, this is Mike Brennan, uh, one of the lead scientists. Um, I just wanted to, to comment how it, how uh, the power of telepresence enables us to to bring all these people live. So we have uh, June and, and and his colleagues in Japan. We have ourselves out at uh, Midway, which is. Um, uh, well, for us, it was a five-day transit north of Hawaii, and we have, have a whole bunch of other uh, scientists ashore uh, spread out uh, throughout the world, but, but a, a whole collection of them at the Exploration Command Center in, uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland, in their, their DC NOAA office. Uh, so it, it's just great to have everybody here able to participate uh, and talk, talk together as we do this uh, live as one team. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And, uh, uh, also point out that we actually have a, a separate team that's also out doing another research expedition by no other than Bob Ballard himself who's doing research right now in Egypt and has been tuning in. Uh, hopefully you can follow along. Uh, control room, this is BCC. Can you hear us okay? Hey, yep. Hey, Phil, we got you. Great. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, we were just... Uh, just doing a round of introductions ourselves, and we chatted with uh, June Kamara in, uh, in Japan. So uh, if you guys would like to introduce yourselves to our uh, viewers on Nautilus Live, that would be great. Yeah, roger that, Mike. Uh, I think we're going to start with uh, Jeremy Weirich here. Hey, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning. On your end, this is Jeremy Weirich. I'm director of NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration. Looking forward to joining the team today. Um, heading on out, we had a really great dive yesterday, and uh, we're looking for some more of the same today. So we're going to be knocking on some wood here. But I really appreciate everybody on the Nautilus making this happen, and then everybody online tuning in today. So really appreciate it. I'm going to hand it back over to Phil. Thanks, Chair. Um, it's great to be tuning back in. It felt almost too long between Yorktown and the dive today. Um, pleasure to be here, uh, marine archaeologist for NOAA Ocean Exploration and, and co-lead scientist ashore. Um, here with a bunch of great colleagues that helped make this this work, in addition to all you fine folks on the ship. So over to my colleague, Jim. Hi, everybody. This is Jim Delgado. I'm the other co-lead ashore. I'm the senior vice president of Search, Inc., largest cultural resources and archaeology company in the U.S., and a veteran of uh, maritime archaeological work 
particularly with my colleagues at OET and with NOAA. Uh, we are very, very pleased to be back. Yesterday was an exceptional dive. Uh, I just want to thank everybody on Nautilus for all of the hard work. It, you made it look easy, I would imagine, to folks that aren't familiar with the type of work that is done. But please, uh, on behalf of, of you know, myself and others here, I, the work of everybody on the ship, in the navigation, the work of everybody down there, in flying and documenting and sharing with the public, I mean, all of it. Thank you. Over to our colleagues from the Navy. Yes, hello. Can you hear me okay? We'll lower back. Uh, my name Better is if you're closer to the mic. Thank you. Sorry about <laughs> Hello, my name is Shauna Daniel, I'm an archaeologist with Naval History and Heritage Command. It is quite an honor to be a part of this today. Um, can't wait to see some of the discoveries and uh, learn a little bit more about what occurred to this uh, vessel. Uh, thank you for having us and uh, uh, hope everybody uh, gets to uh, experience what I experienced. Yeah. It's Jeff Morris, and uh, I'm with Nautica. I was on the original expedition that located pieces of Kaga back in 1999 as a sonar and uh, optical imagery analyst for that operation. So good luck tonight. Uh, I've been there many times. I'm kind of jealous that I'm not out there in a control room. But uh, good luck, and uh, it's been great so far. We have other NOAA colleagues, too. Hi, this is Sam Coyer. I'm one of the expedition coordinators for NOAA Ocean Exploration. I've got a background in, in marine archaeology, and I'm excited to be here with my colleagues both uh, at sea and on shore here in Silver Hey, hello, everybody. I'm Joe Hoyt. I'm a marine archaeologist um, that's uh, taking advantage of being here in Silver Spring and, and uh, seeing the incredible work that you guys are doing. Um, and uh, just can't wait to see what, uh, what it looks like on the bottom. Back to you on the ship. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, just an update. We're approaching 4,700 meters uh, of depth, so we're getting there. We've got about uh, five or 600 meters to go. Thank you all for your introductions right now. I just want to um, further emphasize that this dive is such an amazing international uh, collaboration between so many different partners. Uh, we have different universities um, in Japan and in the U.S. that are part of this project as co-investigators. We have um, uh, partners at Papahanaumo Kuakea Marine National Monument and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. We have um, the NOAA Office for Ocean Exploration also um, supporting this and the U.S. Navy uh, Naval History and Heritage Command. So. Um, and that's just a few of the partners. Really, this has been a really uh, amazing joint effort that has taken a lot of planning. So um, thank you all for sharing your uh, different kinds of expertise and making this happen. Without a doubt, such a privilege to be here. Yeah, thanks. Not with Silver Spring here. Sorry, yeah, not with yeah, Silver ahead. Spring here. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. I think Russ and a few other people may have been able to dial in. If that's possible, we should uh, have them introduce themselves. Yeah, anyone who hasn't uh, jumped on yet, if you're listening and you're able to, to introduce yourselves, that would be great. Science Party, this is Russ Matthews. Can you hear me? Hey, yeah, Russ, loud and clear. Hi, Russ. Fantastic. So uh, I'm Russ Matthews, uh, president of Air Sea Heritage Foundation, and um, been working on uh, projects like this for, for quite some time. I've got the chance to work with, with both OET and NOAA in the past. I was the uh, historic aviation specialist on the first characterization of uh, uh, USS Independence, and also had the, uh, the privilege of leading the search for uh, Samoan Clipper off of uh, Pongo Pongo in 2019 on board Nautilus. Uh, 
and uh, very pleased to be back here with uh, with my shipmates, at least uh, virtually. Thanks, Russ. Good to have you here. I'm not sure if uh, Akifumi or Randy, if you're with us, uh, we'd love to hear from you. While we're waiting, I just wanted to provide a little bit of contextual information. So we are diving on a target that was mapped in 2019, never been visually inspected. Uh, so it's just suspected of being uh, the aircraft carrier Akagi, the flagship, uh, that pivotal battle. Um, however, we are not, uh, we have no information of whether that's the case. And this will be the first time that we'll get a chance to visually inspect it. Um, there were three aircraft carriers that were lost in this very area, one, only one of which has been visually inspected, one of which has been mapped, and one of which has not yet been mapped or inspected. And so, uh, yeah, we'll get to find out here soon. Yes, and we are heading into incredibly deep waters, over 5,000 meters or about three miles deep. Um, so this is really pushing the limits of what uh, current remotely operated vehicles are designed to do. Yeah, certainly what OET's um, technologies are designed to do, you know, uh, engineers are, are brilliant problem solvers and it is possible to solve all these problems. There are vehicles that dive all the way to what we call full ocean depth. They're 11,000 meter, meter rated vehicles. Our 4,000 meter rated vehicles, like Hercules, uh, can get us to 50% of the world's oceans. Uh, a 6,000 meter rated vehicle will get you to over 80% of the world's oceans. Uh, so all about you know, matching a technology and a tool for the task at hand. And as we approach these dives, the, the tool we have left ready to deploy uh, today uh, is ROV Atalanta, ROV Little Hercules, which had planned to be part of the investigation. Um, we found some errors uh, and some issues that we were not able to resolve at sea, um, but so proud of this team finding the solution to continue moving forward. And um, ROV Atalanta yesterday did provide some, you know, with the help of this fantastic team, provided some incredible visuals. So uh, exploration is hard and uh, it's a great example of continuing to move forward. Yeah, teamwork and perseverance for sure. And if you'd like to see any um, highlights from the dive yesterday on USS Yorktown, um, feel free to check out Nautis Live's uh, social media. There are some photos already uploaded uh, if you'd like to see some of those um, captured images from yesterday. More coming soon. And we do have a global audience joining us as well. Um, viewers from the US, uh, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Sweden, Portugal, Norway, Netherlands, Mexico, Japan, Italy, Israel, Denmark, and Austria. So thank you all for tuning in and um, visiting this historical site with us. And just for some more information about um, Akagi, it was built in the 1920s and retrofitted with a single large flight deck ahead of World War II. 
Akagi uh, means red castle, and it sailed with a crew of about 1,600 servicemen. Uh, it's quite long at uh, 855 feet or 260 meters, um, and it was the flagship for Japan's first air fleet. Um, do you, uh, one of our um, archaeology archaeology team members, could you comment on what that means to be a flagship and if that's like a especially pivotal role? Yeah, so a flagship means it's it's the lead uh, ship in a, in a fleet. Um, and so it was actually the uh, flagship for uh, Admiral Yamamoto for the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor in on June uh, December seventh, nineteen forty-one. Uh, flagship also means that you know the admirals normally uh, on that for the the midway battle. Um, it served for first air fleet commander Vice Admiral uh, Nagumo. Um, so he was on board that while Admiral Yamamoto was on the battleship uh, Nagato in, a, in the other task force uh, for the midway assault. The, um, the task force of the three of the four aircraft carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu, was called Kido Butai. Um, and they, they were the ones that sent their um, aircraft in one flight group to um, bomb uh, Midway Island at the beginning of this conflict. Um, and then it, it was interesting, I was reading, reading up on this. Um, so they, were, they had their flight coordination down to the point that they could, all four carriers could, could send up their pilots who would form into one large um, you know, assault force at, like immediately upon taking off from the aircraft carriers which is very difficult to do. The U.S. Were, did not have uh, that sort of uh, training in terms of their pilot, their forma air formations. Um, and so they sent up um, groups that kind of like, from from, all, from the three aircraft carriers kind of kind of separated. They Some of them formed into groups as like from their own carriers, but they, they were not able to, to group themselves into one large force. So it was, uh, it was certainly a show of, um, of training and, and resolve uh, for, for the, all of those fighter pilots to, to come up into one, one, uh, one group like that, because uh, taking off from aircraft carriers is very difficult. Thank you. And we jump in here. We got, had a, several audience members um, excited about the opportunity to learn about the significance of Papahanaumu Kuakea um, from the Native Hawaiian perspective throughout this expedition. And it certainly has been a privilege for us to sail with uh, cultural liaison and leader of these efforts, Mahina Alani Cavalieri, as well as our permit representative and guest educator uh, and education specialist for Papahanaumu Kuakea Marine National Monument, Malia Evans, who, along with our other Kanaka OEV team members and colleagues have been leading um, protocol as we approach these places, um, certainly before and after every dive. This helps set our intention in this place. It helps us honor the space and um, develop our collective energy and to honor that we are in the realm of Po. We are in the sacred realm of ancestors for the Native Hawaiian people ever more poignant as we're here and have the opportunity to dive on a site and remember the events, the service, and the enormous sacrifice and violence that occurred here in the Battle of Midway. So we are so grateful for uh, collectively our team on board and we extend that to all of you that are joining us here to be able to honor um, these two nations that were tremendous foes at this time and yet together now get to explore these sites and honor these servicemen tell these stories and also celebrate that these places are now within um, a very special marine protected realm. These are in Papahanaumo Kuhukea Marine National Monument, nominated as a national marine sanctuary, um, protected in these waters where we can um, have both of these things. We can remember these stories, we can remember these sad stories and also celebrate um, what the, our collective views of the ocean, our collective experience and care for these places into the future with their protection. So as we um, pass over 5,000 meters, Mike or Hans, would you like to s share any words before our minute of silence? Yeah, I just um, would like to point out that 
that a uh, number of sailors died on these aircraft carriers. And uh, what we're looking at today will be a carrier that was uh, evacuated, abandoned, prior to being scuttled. Uh, it was unable for the Japanese to bring this carrier back to Japan. And so she was sunk, uh, the vessel was sunk by torpedoes launched by four destroyers. And there's somewhat of a respectful ceremony to that. So although no one was aboard when the ship went down, uh, there was loss of life in the battle. And uh, on this vessel, 267 Japanese servicemen lost their lives during the battle. So it's very fitting to have the, the cultural element that we do on this mission, recognize the sacredness of the monument, the sacredness of Po and what that means for people in Hawaii and the special resting place for those who lost their lives in this historic event. Thank you so much, Hans. So in addition to our cultural protocol, our sounding of the ship's horn at launch, um, in honor of the over 3,400 sailors and airmen, uh, hundreds of aircraft, seven vessels that sank in the Battle of Midway, please everyone join us in a minute of silence and remembrance. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Megan. Arigato. Mahalo. So we're just passing 5,100 meters. Uh, this r target is uh, <coughs> about 5,350. So we could be seeing some of the, uh, the upper parts of it um, in the next couple hundred meters. or in the next 100 meters. Mike, could you explain for folks how you, you know, kind of what is our plan or maybe our navigators and pilots can help explain that as well about, Yeah. Um, certainly we can only see so far, but we have other tools that'll help us make this approach. Yeah, so we um, we have a map from uh, from last night. We, we did a, or I guess earlier this morning, we did a, uh, a multi-beam pass over this, this site, uh, over coordinates we had from the 2019 survey. Um, and just amazingly to me, at this de these depths, we're able to uh, detect a target of this size with the multi-beam, which I did not think was possible. So huge shout out to our navigation and mapping team. Um, so we know, we, we know approximately where the wreck is. We're not quite sure about the orientation. So we're coming down slowly. We will acquire it in our sector scanning sonar that's on the, uh, on the vehicle um, and descend uh, adjacent to it. We're, not gonna, we're gonna try not to come down right over it. Um, and we're going to begin like we did yesterday with Yorktown with a, a, a survey of the deck edge or the, the upper part of the, of the vessel. The, the deck edge or the flight deck may not be there because uh, it was destroyed uh, almost completely by, we believe, by fire and by the, the aerial bombs. Um, so it'll be the, as close to the deck edge and the hangar deck as we can get. We'll do a full 360 um, documentation pass around the, the, the deck edge before doing the same at the mudline. Um, looking for battle damage and diagnostic features. 
Um, and in doing so, we'll be able to get a measurement of the length of the wreck as well. Uh, we'll probably end the dive uh, by moving out a little bit and looking at a debris field that the side scan sonar from 2019 uh, indicated is, is surrounding the wreck. Uh, Mia, did you want to add anything? No, I think you did a great job, Mike. Thanks. That's the plan until it changes. And for any viewers that were wondering um, what multi-beam was referring to, that is multi-beam sonar. So unlike single beam sonar, which uses just one transducer to map the seafloor, uh, multi-beam has multiple simultaneous sonar beams um, spread out in a, in a fan-shaped pattern. Um, and this can cover the space both directly under the ship and out towards the side a bit. Um, so this can more comprehensively give us a better idea of the seafloor depth, orbithymetry, and um, cover more space in a, in a shorter time span. And then, uh, Mike, you mentioned part of um, our search pattern, right? Um, could you describe maybe some of the damage that happened to Akagi and um, what you're expecting to see due to that, or Hans, or any of our um, archaeological colleagues? Yeah, so there were a couple of uh, misses from the aircraft um, that, uh, just like at Yorktown, that uh, detonated in the water, but very close. So there may be some shrapnel or uh, impact, uh, like uh, shockwave damage from that. There was one, the second um, uh, bomb drop uh, landed right behind, right after the, uh, the, the island um, and punched through the deck. Uh, wh now what was happening was uh, the Japanese carriers were rearming their planes. They were taking off uh, the aerial bombs that had been meant to drop on Midway in a second run. And they had just learned that the American carriers were there um, and they were they're rearming with tor torpedoes uh, to attack the carriers. So the the all of these bombs were still in the hangar deck. They had not been put below. So when this bomb hit, it detonated like eighty thousand ton, uh, not tons, eighty thousand pounds of uh, of these uh, ordnance, uh, uh -huh. which caused an explosion um, kind of throughout the ship. So that's why we believe uh, that the flight deck is probably mostly gone. This set the uh, carrier on fire. Um, and they were unable to get it under control. One of the other things that kind of uh, was different between uh, how the Japanese um, servicemen try, you know, tried to put out the fire versus how Yorktown did is uh, the U.S. learned a valuable lesson in the sinking of USS Lexington a few weeks before this at the Battle of Coral Sea. Um, Lexington also caught on fire that they couldn't put out, um, and they learned that the the fuel lines that were used for fueling aircraft um, burned, you know, as it would when when there's fuel in the line. So the, the Americans developed a way to purge the fuel from the air, from the from the lines uh, with CO2, so that the the entire network of of fuel uh, didn't catch fire when there was a fire on the ship. So that's how they were able to put out the fires on Yorktown quite quickly. Uh, and because they had not yet lost a carrier, the, the Japanese didn't hadn't uh, put that into effect. So that's why the, these four carriers, uh, when they were bombed, in addition to the ordnance detonating, that's why they were able, they, the fires became uncontrollable. Um, so we, we expect to see uh, probably very little of the flight deck remaining, uh, but that's one of the things that we'll be paying close attention to try to document. Well, would there um, be like debris or just completely uh, like debris surrounding the areas of the wreck, or just it would be completely um, not something you can see anymore. Well, uh, that's another question. So we know there's debris around the uh, around the wreck. What it uh, contains is, is kind of a matter of uh, for us to find out. Keep in mind that the all four of these wrecks, just like Yorktown, uh, did not sink where they were damaged. So there there were bombs dropped on them, and they continued uh, sailing as well as drifting eventually. Uh, after that, so we're in a different, where the vessel ended up is different from where it oh. was bombed. Uh, so if planes were thrown overboard or pieces of debris from the wreck, That's, or from uh, the ship, 50 meters um, there was not, 50 meters. 
that, that's on the seabed some, somewhere else. Uh, so we're going to take a look and see. It'll help. It'll help us understand um, what sank with the ship and what was already missing uh, by determining what's still here and, and in the debris field around the wreck. We're at approaching 5,300 meters, so we're probably about uh, less than 100 meters from from the seabed. Wow. 38 meters from the seabed. 38. Okay. Roger. That's a good point, Mike. After the uh, the the bomb strike near the middle elevator, the ship burned and yep. continued to float and drift. As you say, it burned all night, and it wasn't scuttled. I think until early the next morning by those four other destroyers. And do you think the sinking process could also affect it? I remember yesterday um, during Yorktown, you said it kind of sank like a leaf in the wind, kind of turning over itself. Um, will that affect what, we'll, what we might see as well? Uh, no, because, so that was uh, the effect of the Yorktown's flight deck being, main being still um, present. Uh, this one, we don't believe the flight deck is still there, so it would not have entrained water and acted like a parachute. Um, but it does still have a bow that's meant to cut through water, so it probably it righted itself, as we we can tell from the sonar. And pro my guess, we'll find out, is that it's um, gone into the sediment bow first, slightly. Um, but that's to be determined. Looks like we have the wreck on the scanning sonar. Looking that way, yeah. Thank you for that explanation, Mike. And I just wanted to um, reach out to our uh, co-investigators on shore and our Japanese colleagues as well. If you have anything to add to the conversation, please feel free to chime in at any time. So we're going to slow the sonar scan speed down here to get a little higher resolution uh, scan here, but it's possible that we're uh, in the middle of wreck as uh, yesterday. Yep. Getting a target on uh, both the left and the right side of Atlanta here. You're a little bit hard to hear, Dan. Could you check if your mic is close up? Yeah. Can Thank you hear me you. now? Much improved. We're just uh, slowing our sonar down here to get a little better scan. We're about 25 meters off the seabed, according to uh, Atlanta's altimeter. Yeah, I think you're 25 meters off the wreck, which is itself probably about 30 meters off the seabed. I think the depth we got here was close to 5,400. 536-something. Five, on the board there. Yeah, this is uh, Russ Matthews just chiming in to say um, how incredible it is to be really just on the cusp of discovery. We're poised to a uh, chapter in the history of the of Midway and uh, and it's a real uh, privilege to be here with with all of you and uh, and experience truly the the essence of exploration. Thank you, thank you, Russ. Easy. Ten meters a minute. Just starting to get a visual of it. I see that faint visual. Yeah, we have the wreck in sight. The 
just going to pause here and uh, let the sonar scan a few more times. Okay. I was going to do both. So that was a heading to one two zero. If anyone's uh, logging that, I'm going to swing around to the right 90 degrees and just uh, look around us a little before we come down. Basically looking south there. So just some context for our audience and answering the question if this wreck has been um, dove before. Uh, in October 2019, a team from Vulcan Inc. and the U.S. Navy did conduct a high-resolution mapping survey um, aboard the research vessel Petrol, which uh, found the approximate area of Akagi and identified it um, from the sonar images, but it was not investigated at that time with visual surveys. So this is our first look um, of Akagi. Yes, of the site believed to be Akagi. We, one of the very, very exciting things, whatever, whatever wreck we've just had our glimpse of, this is the first time in 81 years it's been witnessed um, but we don't yet know we're not yet ready to confirm um, we believe this is a kagi uh, but again su in such a historic event and in falling over three miles from the surface um, the final positions of these vessels are, are not yet confirmed so come with us this is exploration at its at its purest at its best done um, interdisciplinary so, that's experts, looking three, zero, international zero, three, experts, zero there. all together here. All right, thank you, Megan. So mm -hmm. it, it seems like this wreck is oriented approximately north-south. We'll figure out which if the bower stern is north uh, a little bit later. Yeah, correct, approximately north-south. Um, Archaeology team, if you're not Maybe too busy right now, um, could you help explain what kind of features um, you would be looking for to confirm whether this is a Kagi or perhaps another vessel? Yeah, so the the main thing we're going to look at is the placement of the island, or the, uh, which is like where the bridge was, because um, they were on actually different sides of the carriers. Uh, Akagi's was on the starboard side, and Kaga's was on the port side, for example. Um, and then there's also their smokestacks were oriented differently than the U.S. carriers, which were part of the island. Their smokestacks actually came out the side of the flight deck and angled downward, or like at an angle downward. Um, and they were all different sizes and shapes for the, the three carriers that are in this area. So that'll be a pretty, pretty good indicator, uh, as well as bow and stern uh, features, like how many so struts they were holding up the, the flight range deck. A bit there, so those are 30 meter range still there. at the moment. Yeah. So that we hope it's that simple. It's be, a, uh, a difficult task, given what the vessel went through in yeah. the, the fires, the so fact that the flight deck is gone. Meters, uh, we mentioned earlier we have a number of references we look at. 
But those references aren't going to show us what we're going to see on the bottom of the ocean. So, the way, so 45, we're very open for assistance from our shore team, uh, from our colleagues in there. Japan, uh, to help us understand this very different view we'll be getting. So I'm going to come back around to that original. Over uh, that's a Kagi. Maybe uh, 135 ish, something like that. Mike, I would suggest another uh, feature to be looking for are the 8 inch casemated guns that were present on Akagi, a kind of a holdover from her origins as a battle cruiser that were uh, towards the stern. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Um, do you know where those were on the ship? Yeah, it looks uh, like sets of uh, three on port and starboard side uh, towards the stern. Hang on here, stern quarter. That's back. What I call the original heading? 120 or 105? Mike, did you copy that? Uh, I did not. Yeah, somewhere in that neighborhood. So, um, Frank, the has. Uh, six eight inch guns. They're located in casemates in the mm. third section three on each side. Yeah, that's Roger that. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna. We're looking basically. Uh, I'm gonna look straight down again. Yeah, we have a, a printout here that um, has a Kagi and Kaga on it, and I was looking at the wrong one, of course. <laughs> As you would. <laughs> There's also a difference to the funnel on the starboard side, which is could be distinctive if the funnel is still there. I think there's some differences on the forward end of the ship to the hangar shape underneath the flight deck, but again, we won't know if things are still there to be recognizable until we get there. Yeah, I was just uh, trying to make sure that our onshore uh, team were, was, was on their toes. I, I said the wrong side and I got three texts immediately, so good job, guys. Could you explain maybe what we think we're looking at right now, this structure? Uh, I'll explain it when I have an idea. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we're all I'm, figuring this out together. Yeah, I'm really not right. sure. Because, um, you know, I'm looking at schematics, but it really depends on what's remaining. Uh, like, it, this may be something that was under the flight deck if that's no longer there. So it'll gotcha. take us a little bit longer, I think, to... Uh, parallel down the side of this thing before we really even know wh what part of the wreck we're on. Yeah, it might, it might be easy to think, here's a raised structure, so, you know, this is part of uh, the island, but we don't know that we're looking at the flight deck yet, so right. we don't know what elevation in the ship this structure is. We'll eventually see something that's recognizable, and we can tie ourselves to that based on the plans, but so far, not there. Gotcha. What are some of the most recognizable things that um, we would be looking for? Well, there's there's gun tubs, um, there's the smokestack, the bridge. Um, bow and stern are, will be obvious, but we're n near neither one of those. Um, yeah, different um, elements of the deck, um, different supports, and uh, things that were along the, the, like the hangar deck side. Um, we'll see. So... Uh, Mike, based on the sonar scan there, uh, I'm in sector mode now, obviously. I'm just going to slow it down and get yeah. a better picture. Uh, but you can see over here on the left, we're getting more of a return. Sure, yep. Uh, there's a bit of a, a stronger return here, just to the, uh, to the right of us a bit. But based on what I'm seeing here, I would say the taller structure uh, the better return is what we're getting is is uh, about 20 meters, 40 meters to our left. Sure. Uh, my s my guess, based on the sonar, is that we're on the starboard side, and that over there would be the uh, the remains of the tower. Um, to the left. That no, to the right, the taller part to the, that one there. You think this? Yeah, because remember okay. this, th well, this was a flat flight deck. We'll see what remains, but I, that high point is kind of the position of, I would expect the, uh, the island to be in. But let's, hmm, I guess we could go to the left along this edge here and uh, 
and start to see what features we see along this side of the ship and work our way around. Uh, which, uh, but if, if, you, if it doesn't really matter to me which direction we go, if, if one is easier for you guys. Right. Um, let's step, I, I think I want to step away just uh, yeah. a little bit so we can light up the rest of it. So as we move left or right, I'm, like if I move directly left right now, I have targets higher than, than I am. Sure. So if I step back a little, then we can move perpendicular to it? Yep. Okay. So let's step 10 meters at uh, 285. 285, yeah. Correct. That's actually one of a somewhat unique feature of the Akagi, if that's what we're looking at. The tower of the island was on the port side. Yeah. Rather than the starboard side, which was more usual. I think it was a bit of an experiment to see what worked better. Um, but on some of the other carriers, Thanks, the island is on the starboard side along with the stack. Yep. Yeah, Kago is like that. I think uh, Frank Thompson said that here you also had it on the port. Right. I think that's what he just said. I mean, correct. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you want to talk about why it was unique that they were on port side? It was just an oddity for the Japanese design. Um, they, uh, for whatever reason, they put the island on the port side for both of them, and then uh, later tests showed that um, they got tended to get better wind over the flight deck and less turbulence by putting it on the starboard side. Why that is, I'm, I'm not a scientist for that respect, so we don't really know, but um, it was uh, you know, just an oddity. They were the only Navy that did that. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm just going to uh, uh, lift Atalanta up a little bit while we step away here. Abundance of caution until I get uh, a little better consensus of the uh, site here. decided to uh, set in the port side and uh, the orbitary. The decision was a bit disputable because the final position was also tricky and um, there was a bit of argument on the design. Uh, there were arguments over the design? Yeah. We'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, there was a lot of experimentation going on at that time, and uh, the original design for Akagi actually had three separate flight decks. And uh, you know, just it, as they experiment, as they learned and experienced, um, you know, with the ship, they determined you know what was what was going to work best. This was a, a new, revolutionary new uh, way of uh, you know uh, conducting warfare at sea. Uh, that move is probably going to take about 10 minutes. I'm just going to step out for two minutes. So, team, what do you think was the feature we were seeing there, that that point? Not the bow, but what do we anticipate that was? Yeah, I'm um, I'm really not sure. Um, we're going to need to see more of the wreck to, to figure out um, kind of where we are on it, which side we're on. Um, and, and, I mean, that's not, that wasn't flight deck, so... It's possible it was something that was underneath. We're going to need to wait a little bit to find out. Um, the other thing I noticed is that 
the visibility here, at least for the moment, seems worse than yesterday. Which and just for your reference, it's going to take a, about 10 minutes for that move we just called in. What was the move you called in? Um, 10 meters at 285, just when we kind of got down to try and orient to Atalanta at a better angle. Okay, thanks. Mike, for those of us who haven't seen the sonar uh, imagery that, um, that led to this spot, can you give us a sense of, you know, does it look like it's a, uh, like an intact ship? Do you have a sense of the, of the overall length and, and the dimensions of what we're, what we're uh, exploring? Yeah, it's, um, it, it, it is intact. Uh, it, at least it's not like broken in half or anything. Um, it looks like there's a, a large depression on the inside, which tells me that the flight deck may be completely gone. Um, they did measure it, um, and it was it was close to the right dimensions. Um, if you Google um, Akagi shipwreck sonar, there are like I was able to find it on on uh, on a search engine. They released it with with a news uh, press or a press release uh, in 2019 when it was discovered. So you could you could find it. Um, and then take a look at it. It does look like there's an impact crater and a debris field in a kind of a circle around it, which we'll be taking a look at later in the dive. Certainly nothing like that intact flight deck on the Yorktown no, no, wreck site. No, for sure. Much more of an outline of what it would have been a battle cruiser. Yeah, and depending on what what is missing, uh, could make this a very challenging uh, could could make it challenging to to identify uh, different parts of it. So we got our work cut out for us. And just another note to our viewers: it will take a while for the ROV to maneuver simply because the cable is so long. This is over 5,000 meters in depth, so um, it takes a while for the movements of the ship above to translate um, to the ROV below. And we are also approaching the ship with a lot of caution uh, since shipwrecks can sometimes have overhangs or other things coming off of it, and we want to prevent any entanglement. What happened while I was gone? Anything? Yeah, you missed the whole wreck. Oh. We're, we're done. We saw the whole thing. And there's um, fresh baked goods in the galley. If anyone is interested, and they are very tasty. So we had a comment earlier about how um, the design for Akagi was maybe there's different considerations involved. So how does that design compare to other similar ships in the fleet? Um, was there anything that made it particularly unique? I know you've already gone over some of the distinguishing features, but anything especially um, related to how um, the people functioned on the ship or its purpose um, in the fleet for battle. So, um, Kaga and Akagi were both uh, the same size, which is 855 feet long. Um, they were they were the two largest uh, of the carriers, um, and so, but they they were both built on, um, or, or Akagi for sure, but they were built on um, the hulls of a, of a battle cruiser, and then they they. Uh, made the decision to add the the flight decks later. That may be one of the reasons why this the stacks were uh, positioned as they were, because maybe they couldn't route the the smoke the same way.
I think one thing it did allow was them to then have multiple hangar decks. So there are actually multiple hangar decks below the main flight deck now, unlike the U.S. carrier Yorktown, which had the single hangar deck that we were looking at. And does multiple hangar decks mean uh, more aircraft can be carried on the ship? Uh, I, th I think so. I think I saw the original capacity was something like 66 aircraft, but that was expanded to maybe 86. But I, d I don't know, Professor Kimura, uh, do you know about the additional capacity for a uh, carrier like Akagi? It appears to be. Seabed. <clears throat> Is there any chance of finding aircraft within the carrier or nearby? Were the aircraft um, deployed already? Uh, all deployed? Um, there were aircraft uh, still on board. Some of them had deployed and they were getting other ones ready uh, to, to deploy uh, when the bomb hit. Um, my, my guess is that a lot of these were thrown overboard uh, at the when the bomb hit, um, which is not the place where the ship sank um, because it, it drifted overnight uh, before they scuttled it. So there is a chance that there were aircraft in the hangar decks that went down with the ship, and that's one of the reasons we're going to be looking at the debris field. Um, but there, my guess is that any that were on the flight deck uh, are probably on the seabed uh, where it was bombed, not at this current place. So now that we've stepped away, uh, Atlanta altimeter is uh, 36, 38 meters off the seabed. And... Uh, so that first uh, altitude reading was likely above the wreck itself, uh, somewhere I'm pinging off the wreck itself. So I've just increased the range on the sonar to 150 meters, and uh, we should get kind of an overall view here of uh, the length of the wreck. <coughs> and they're over here looking this way. I don't know. What? And uh, good orientation on uh, Atlanta's current heading is uh, 110. So we're pretty much perpendicular to it. So 110 plus or minus 90 is going to be your. Uh, Remember, I failed horribly at math, so that's why you're here. Now, whatever those, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop us down a bit. You all right with that, Mike? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, come on down. We should be able to uh, get some better images here as I drop down. I'm going to uh, tilt the camera up a little, but I'll drop down first just to uh, keep an eye on anything. Okay, wreck back in sight. Oh, well. We're still. Uh, really close to the edge of that sonar image, so yeah. I'm going to just come down nice and slow here.
So we're still looking pretty much straight down with that Atlanta. Okay. There's a gun tub. It looks like there's a gun tub on the, on the top right, so that's... We might be in here. If we are where I think we might be, that means that the smokestack's going to be to our right and pretty close to us. But that's going to be coming out from the flight deck. Um, so something to watch to the right for if we go that way. Roger. Switch back to uh, sector mode on our sonar here and uh, Oh. I think we might still be a little close, but uh, it's 25 meters altitude below me here, so drop down a little more. And I don't see anything directly below us. We're just kind of close to the edge here, so I'll drop down a few more meters and then we'll uh, tilt up and look around. Okay, Roger. And a question from our audience, maybe perhaps our ROV intern could answer. Um, can you explain uh, how Ant Atalanta moves? Does it have thrusters? In which directions can it move? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Atalanta does have thrusters. Uh, we keep on a auto heading to kind of keep us um, steady. So as you can tell, um, we're to the camera we are seeing it's kind of seeing one place if we turn off auto heading um you could kind of be spinning all over the place um and we'd have to manually uh use our thrusters to keep us in place so that's why we keep auto heading on and um with that we can turn um any any way we want from uh 10 degrees or uh, however degrees we want to see depending on what uh the archaeologists want to see and uh, with the camera uh, we have a up and down function we have a tilt so that will kind of um, like right now we're tilting up uh, but uh, we're bouncing up and down with the cable right now but yeah that's kind of kind of how how we use Atalanta awesome thanks for sharing we had a lot of questions about uh, how Atalanta moves yeah no worries Hey, I'm gonna. That's the camera at 45 there. I'm gonna come up just a little bit, so we can. Uh, yeah, that's helpful. It's a lot better visibility than we thought when we were looking at earlier. Yeah, the lighting there though. Yeah. Uh, if I tilt down just a little bit more and come up, you'll know, we'll be able to see further. I think we might still be a little close to it to move uh, parallel down the. Seems like we might be able to look at the. Uh, the top of the wreck and the mud line at the same time, it seems pretty buried here as well. Uh, I'd say I'm up past still, the water line. I'm still 20 meters, uh, I guess about 20 meters under Atalanta, so. And I'm concerned if uh, I come down there, the, <coughs> well, the. Bottom out? No, the, we'll start stirring up the sediment. Mm. Yeah, fair point. I mean, we might step away a little. So we're even up and down just a little bit more than yesterday, maybe a couple meters. Yeah. That's... Uh, <coughs> Right around 22 meters there off the seabed. I can look around here if you want, Mike, left or right. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm kind of curious to move uh, to our, well, is that a different one or are we to move past it? Uh, that's I that's a different the, tub. Sorry, I looked to the left there. No, no, so. you're good. That, that, that actually helps me quite a bit. I think I know where we are. Um, so unless we're on it? the other side of the wreck. But I think otherwise I know where we are. Yeah. Um, if we could move actually to the right, I think we're going to see the uh, the smokestack coming out if it's still there. Yeah. And that's, that could be an important diagnostic feature. Yeah. So there's a tub to the left and a tub to the right of us. Yeah, so. and that's, that's really helping me because... Um, I think these are the gun tubs that Russ was talking about. There is a gun there, apparently a gun. This might be one of the... But it could also be here. 12.7 centimeter yeah, actually, we might be over here. Guns. Yeah, I don't know that it's a big casemate gun. It's, I don't think yeah. it's the 20 centimeter. Uh, yeah, I'm changing my opinion, actually. Uh, the, hmm, the stack could actually be the other direction, if we're here. Yeah, I would agree with Hans. I, I think these are more likely anti-aircraft guns than the uh, than the case mated yeah, uh, so eight that, inchers. Yeah, thanks, Russ. That um, actually gives us two options because there were those kind of aft, and there are also those forward of the stack. So eh, we're getting there. We're narrowing down the places we could be. It'll be good to get a closer look at this gun tub because it's not a 20 millimeter case made gun. I think it's either 12.7 centimeter uh, type 89 or a type 96 a, 25 millimeter. Sorry, Hans, we're in a good spot to zoom in there if you would like. I would. Yes, love please. Love it. Okay, Jenna, it's all you. Or if you could get the ship to stop bouncing for a minute, that'd be great. Uh, shore side, do you think that's a Type 96? seen any circular gun tubs on this plan yet. They've all been semicircular. No, those are too big. I think in plan view this might yeah, be maybe. semicircular because the other half would be covered by the deck. Well, not like not this. Oh, right, not that. <laughs> I'm, uh, we'll see. You've got better pictures, Mike. Yeah. Well, these are these are in that 3D reconstruction book, so maybe someone got something wrong, or we're just not where I think we are yet. Oh no, that's not right. Hmm. I mean, these are circular. The 12 centimeter guns. Well, I think these are the casemates. Yeah. These are the 20 centimeters. But they could be gone. Oh no, that's not right. Well, we'll probably see more of these. I think there were eight twin 12.7 centimeter anti-aircraft guns distributed around the ship. Yeah, they were on stands like this. We're basically uh, in the middle of the wreck, so you can flip a coin and go one way or the other. Or go with your gut, Mike. Yeah. 